Hi, this is Chad with the Art of Engineering podcast. On the heels of our April Fool's podcast, we'll come back and enjoy this interesting session on Japanese whiskey. This podcast was recorded as part of a live event at our local Structural Engineering Institute. The room can be noisy at times, but I promise if you hang in there, an interesting story with themes of ambition, travel, politics, and drama, as well as art, balance, nature, ecosystems, science, and technology. Enjoy. Okay, I guess we're ready to get started. So, uh, thanks everybody for coming. My name is Chad Harden. I'm with Michael Baker International, and I'm the past chair of the Structural Engineering Institute. Just wanted to thank everybody for coming. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the cocktail you had at the beginning. So this was with the Suntory Toki whiskey, and it's it's really designed for both the, the new generation and old generation. And they have some great concepts around Toki. Toki means time in Japan, and it's a blend of uh, several distilleries in Japan. It's the Hukushu, Yamazaki, and Chita distilleries. It's actually a blend of malts uh, and grain, which means malts. Malt whiskeys are made from barley, and grain whiskeys are made mostly from corn. So it's a blend. Uh, and in Japan, as well as in America, whiskey is on a huge popularity surge. And this whiskey is really designed to be made in the mixed drink. And one of my favorite drinks is the Japanese highball. And that's kind of the picture there. Uh, so that's kind of the reason why this was introduced as the cocktail for the beginning of the presentation. So. But Centauri honors the ancestry and heritage, but it's a reinvention for the future of whiskey as they recognize the popularity. So as we get in tonight, I want to let you know that this is not just a, uh, it's not just a whiskey tasting and it's not just a technical presentation. It's actually, we're going we're gonna to travel to good time and you're going to get to know about Japanese whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> of course we are. How far about it? You're going to learn so much about Japanese whiskey here and it's going to just be a full frontal assault on your senses for it. From the information, the smells, the food. So sit back, relax. <laughs> so our story of Japanese whiskey starts just over 164 years ago. Uh, so actually, going back even 400 years ago, there was an isolationist policy in Japan uh, under the to Tokugawa shogunate. I'll probably butcher some names here, but but no one was allowed in or out of the country. No communication under. Uh, penalty of death. Uh, but America wanted to start trading with Japan. So in July 1853, U.S. Commodore, this guy here, really happy looking fellow, <laughs> Matthew Perry, he legally entered Edo Bay uh, with his black ships and demanded treaty negotiations with the Japanese. He had a letter from President Mil uh, Millard Fillmore, a white flag, and a few, and a few gifts as part of the delegation. Part of the gifts was a barrel of rye whiskey intended for the emperor, uh, uh, and he gave that to the Japanese rep representatives. They promptly told him, don't ever come back. <laughs> <laughs> but he came back six months later anyway. Uh, no, he said he, would yeah, I'm sorry. he said he would be back in a year, even though he was told not to come back. He came back six months later. He came back with more whiskey. Uh, he came, actually, a barrel of whiskey for the emperor, uh, 20 gallons for the commissioners, Hiyashi and Abe, I want you to remember that name, Abe. So this is uh, one of the commissioners, and this is uh, 164 years ago. So Abe is, is one important name here. Um, but that barrel of whiskey never made it to the emperor, for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and it sparked a revolution in Western ideas, uh, new technologies, and it ended up it ended, ending the isolationist policy. Not wholly in part to whiskey, but it, it played a big part. Uh, the Treaty of uh, Peace and Amity between the United States and Japan was signed on Perry's ship, the Powhatan, and again, it's brought an end to 220 years of national seclusion. So by 1868, the shogunate had ended, uh, and it brought enormous social and political changes. And in this climate, uh, the Japanese started experimenting and making their own Japanese whiskeys, because again, it was still very difficult to get their hands on American whiskeys or scotches, 
So they came up with what's called ersatz whiskeys. And they just made whiskey with the products and methods that they had available to them. So making it with rice, making it with uh, uh, additives, flavorings, things that we wouldn't really use in whiskey today. But they were just doing their best to really to try it. And, and it became immensely popular. So with that, let's try our first whiskey tasting. Woohoo! <laughs> I work with Bo, so he's going to give me a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> so our first whiskey is the Iway Tradition. So can we go ahead and find that on your, it should be the upper left in the, what is it called, a lowball glass? It's the one glass that's unique from all the others. So go ahead and start <laughs> So on the nose, uh, you, if this is a blend of sherry, bourbon, and wine casks. Uh, the notes, you might taste a little bit of cherry, honey toffee, Ginger. But don't let me tell you, you know, one thing about whiskey is just enjoy it the way you like it. You might, you know, if it has a different palate. I'm just trying to point out some things you might taste. Uh, so the highway tradition, uh, at this distillery is Japan's highest distillery at 2,000, approximately 2,600 feet. Uh, water is really important to Japanese whiskey as it is important to Japanese sake. And the water here is taken from underground streams. Uh, the Iowa Distillery is surrounded by the Central Alps and Southern Alps. It's a blended scotch, again, 75% malt, 25% corn. I guess the one thing I like, you think it's a honey The one thing I like, thing I like about, this, uh, about this distillery is they'll try, they try the most different variables. And this is a theme that we're going to hear about um, throughout the night, is that the Japanese are playing with the variables of the whiskey, and there's a reason for that. But they play with the most. They say this is the, uh, they play with things like different, different barrels, different levels of peatiness, different types of grains and malts. Uh, and they also have different distilleries from, from, so from the Alps all the way to the islands. At the, at the island distillery, they say that it rains about 400 days a year. So. Do they use uh, oak 400. barrels? Yeah, they use oak barrels, <laughs> That's wine amazing. barrels. <laughs> they, they play with the level of burning. And they also, uh, John had a great question, what kind of barrels do they use? So they char the barrels, but they also have different woods, like oaks. They also have a special wood. It's the uh, brother of the, uh, actually little sister of the Japanese oak, and it actually has a, a real peculiar flavor, too. So this, this plays with all the variables possible, different types of stills and everything. And uh, it's a kind of a new, it's a newer whiskey. So they actually had the first whiskey license, but they waited. Uh, some time to, to actually make the distillery. So the distillery manager, Koki Takihari, has a quote, is thinking and acting, repeating over and over, with minute adjustments and variations will become our new know-how. Our homework at the moment is to find a way of making whiskey that is uniquely marked. So I think this is one whiskey that is going to change over the next decade. It's something to, to pay attention to. A little bit of history on this whiskey uh, distillery. In the uh, 1920s, uh, Kichiro Aiwe, who this whiskey is named after, he worked for the Setsu Shuzo Company with Masataka Takatsuru, and that's a name we're going to hear a lot also through the evening. And then he was working under him. When the Shuzo distillery asked him to set up this new distillery, he knew exactly where to look, and this was from the younger, uh, dist uh, the younger master of, of Japanese whiskey, Masataka, Masataka Takatsuru, who had traveled to Scotland to learn about making whiskey, and he made a notebook called the Takatsuru Notebook. And so he based, that's kind of the architecture of all Japanese whiskey, and so he based his distillery off that notebook. Masataka Takatsuru is going to be a theme through the night also, and is one of the last whiskeys we're going to try. So it's interesting, all the, there's a lot of coincidences in the story of Japanese whiskey, and we're going to get more into that. So with that, let's enjoy our first course. So what are we, what's our appetizer here? Let's keep going with the story here. Uh, before we before we dive a little more into the story, uh, a few differences and comparisons to Scotch uh, from Japanese whiskey, and it'll make sense in a minute. Uh, but there's, there's like five different regions in Scotland, a lot of different types from really light scotches to really peaty scotches, uh, my personal favorite. Uh, 
Uh, but one really interesting thing about Scotch whiskey is the distilleries share their whiskeys when they make blended Scotch. They share them, they store them. It protects the distilleries if there was a fire, uh, and it also makes a really complex uh, a taste profile. So the Japanese don't do that. They are fiercely competitive. They don't want to share with anybody. <laughs> so how are they going to achieve the full complex flavor of a Scotch whiskey and be competitive without sharing with anybody and getting different you know, locations, different barrels that it's been aged in? Uh, what they do is they, like the first whiskey we tried, they play with all the different variations and they store those. And this is actually a picture from the Suntory Whiskey Library. Every one of those bottles is oh a different gosh. variation on the theme of distilling whiskey. Wow. So different levels of peatiness, different barrels, different grains, different yeasts. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and so they do that so that they can then mix and create the profiles that they want. And now, this, this is the, the nexus of the whole talk. <laughs> I know it's a lot of words, and that's like the number one thing in, in doing a presentation, is don't do a lot of words. But it's necessary for this, for this slide. So these are the two fathers or grandfathers, I would say, of Japanese whiskey. And uh, you don't have to read all that, uh, but Masataka Takatsuru, I might refer to him as Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> and Sinjiro, Sinjiro Tori. So one of the gentlemen on the bottom, Sinjiro Tori, he is the, the founder of Suntory Whiskey. And the gentleman on the top, Mr. T, is the founder of Nika Whiskey. Okay. Uh, Sinjiro Tori, I'm just going to call him Tori. He was born in 1879. He was born to mainly a business family, a money exchange business in Osaka. That's really important to his story. He was born into uh, a family business that's really money centric. Uh, at age 13, he apprenticed at a local pharmaceutical, and he learned about mixing chem mixing different chemicals and products together. Uh, by 18, and again, that's also supremely important to his story, and we'll see why. In 1899, he was a store owner, so about age 20, he was a store owner, he sold wines, he sold canned goods, and he learned, uh, he started getting really fascinated at, with the time with the Airsats whiskey or Western whiskeys they were trying to imitate. And he started learning more about wine from a Spanish wine trader. Before we get more into his story, let's jump up to Mr. T. So Mr. T was born into a sake making business. Yeah, this is really important. It's like two, two extremes, okay? You've got the, the guy who's more business oriented, and there's the guy who's more technically oriented. Uh, so he actually graduated from Osaka Technical School uh, in, uh, in chemistry, and he, he, entered, he entered the Setsu Shuzo Company under, uh, in Osaka under Kichiro Aiwe, who was kind of his manager. And Aiwe was the same guy who started the whiskey you just tried, okay? He had a, when he entered the Shuzo company, he told the manager there, whose last name was Abe, kind of the same family history, I suspect. I couldn't actually document that. I read a lot, a lot of books on Japanese whiskey, but it's the same last name. So I suspect having the, uh, the first introduction to whiskey being one of the commissioners named Abe. Abe owned the Setsu Shuzo company, who works with Kichiro Highway, who works with Mr. T. Uh, it's, it's all related there. But anyway, when Mr. T entered the Shuzo company, he said, I really want to learn about, about Western whiskey. I want to learn as much as I can on how to make it so that I can go back to my family business and make more sake and make it better. That was his goal at the time. Uh, he didn't quite have the full vision that he gets later on in life. But everybody's really excited about his passion for learning about whiskey, so they send him to Scotland. And about the time that he was working at the Shuzo company, uh, Sinjiro Tori, he starts his Kotobukaya liquor shop for wines and Western liqueurs. And so he's really in love with Ersatz whiskey. He's in love with the new Spanish wines he's learning about from his friend. But he's the only one who likes uh, Spanish wine. It's a very different palate than what they were enjoying in Japan at the time, which was more sweet wines. Okay, So he's sitting on this huge stockpile of Spanish wines that are really unpopular. So what does he do? <laughs> he, goes, he puts his mixing cap back on that he learned from uh, his time uh, working with pharmaceuticals. And he starts mixing the wines in different ways. And he's buying products from the Setsu Shuzo company, who's making um, sake and also the Airsats whiskeys, which are the imitation whiskeys. So they met at this time, most likely. When Mr. T sets off for Scotland, so that uh, the, the Shuzo company wants to steal the fire from Scotland so they can start making whiskeys on their own. 
who sees him off but, but Sanjiro Tori sees him off the boat to Scotland. And he's about to embark on this great adventure to learn about Scottish whiskies. At the same time, back down to Sanjiro Tori, Tori makes a breakthrough with what he calls the Akadama port wine. And he names it Akadama because he's looking for a really iconic Japanese symbol. You've got the Japanese flag and the sun, so he's put that big red spot on there. And he names it the Akadama port wine. Without that wine uh, becoming so popular, it becomes very popular, it makes a ton of money. We probably wouldn't have the story of Japanese whiskey that we do today. Because he has all this money from the famously popular port wine, still in, still in production today, you can still buy it, Kudu uh, Suntory. He has a lot of freedom with the capital that he's, that he's received to now experiment with Japanese whiskey. Takatsuro's in Scotland. He does a number of internships there. So yeah, so Takatsuro, he goes to, Scot he goes to Scotland via the SS Tenyumaru, uh, but he goes to San Francisco first. So he lays over and he uh, spends time at a winery near Sacramento, so he's learning a little bit about wine and the barrels there. He arrives in the UK and registers for classes at the uh, chemistry, classes in chemistry at the University of Glasgow and the Royal Technical College. Uh, there's a student there, Ella Cowan, at the University of Glasgow, who's also in chemistry, and he takes up residence with her family. Um, and then he starts knocking on doors. He gets a, a five-day apprenticeship at the Longmore Distillery in Scotland, and there he learns about the importance of casks, especially ex-sherry casks. Uh, in the summer, he gets a two-week placement at the Bonest Distillery, and there he's introduced to the continuous distillation process and the coffee still. So we're going to learn a little bit about stills later, but there's lots of different kinds of stills. The coffee still, and we're going to show you a picture at the end. It's, uh, it's a really unique kind of still, and it's part of the wet last whiskey that we're going to try. But he kind of falls in love with that still type. In the fall, he studies at the uh, vineyards of Bordeaux, again, learning more about wine. And in December, he, pro he proposes to Ella's sister, Rita, and he actually proposes on Christmas Day. And uh, he was willing to stay in Scotland for her. Obviously, he loves Scottish whiskey. So, um, and she wanted, to, but she wanted to support his dream. Now he has a dream. He's learned so much about Japanese whiskey. He wants to make a genuine, Jap I mean, sorry, he's learned a lot about Scottish whiskey. He wants to make a genuine Japanese whiskey. So they decide to uh, to travel to Japan, but they don't go right away. They get married in January. Uh, both sides of the families were not happy. <laughs> they did it. Well, she doesn't look very happy either. <laughs> uh, they moved to Campbelltown, which is a, a special region in Scotland. They have really smoky scotches. Uh, but he gets a five-month apprenticeship at Hazelburn Distillery. And this is where he keeps his detailed notebook. It's called the Report of Apprenticeship Pot Still Whiskey. And this is called the Takatsuru Note, or the notebook. And this is what becomes the architecture or blueprint for Japanese whiskey. This is the notebook that he turns into Aiwei when he goes back to the Setsu Shuzo company. And this is the notebook that, that uh, Aiwei makes the distillery that you tried, the first distillery, I mean the first whiskey you tried. He bases uh, the distillery off that notebook. So in 1920, he returns to the Setsu Shuzo company. But now it's uh, World War I, the wartime economy denies innovation, there's not a lot of money to go around. And uh, he said as the manager of Ersatz Whiskey. So he's learned all this great information about Ersatz Whiskey, I mean, uh, there's all this great information about genuine Scottish whiskey. And now he comes back and he said as the manager of imitation whiskey. And uh, he describes this period in his life as soul crushing. <laughs> <laughs> so what's he going to do? So he actually, he, uh, he resigns in 1922, and in 1923 he joins uh, Tory at the uh, Kotobukaya Liquor Shop. And that's where we're going to take a break and start try, I believe, our next tasting, the Akashi White Oak. So go ahead and give that one a try. That must be Akashi Blended. Akashi Blended? Yeah, the Akashi Blended. <laughs> so this is a blended scotch. That's too strong. Okay, so this is called a Glen Cairn glass. It's designed to be uh, uh, kind of actually Kyle can probably explain it better than I can. 
Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's designed to, to, to send the, the more uh, stronger vapors out, and it gives you the nice the nice vapors like as you smell. And then when you drink it, it doesn't it doesn't shoot all the vapors into your nose. It's a specially designed glass. So this is one thing they say when you when you really want to learn about whiskey is uh, get used to trying it. It doesn't have to be this glass, but. But don't try it in like five different glasses all the time. Okay. You want kind of a consistency. Yeah, yeah you want to develop a palate. Okay. So. <laughs> you mean your phone? <laughs> <laughs> They're not the same bottles. <laughs> right? Good. So what's really, what's really funny about this distillery, all the other whiskeys in Japan, they, they do what I kind of described, and changing all the variables, keeping it close to the chest. These guys, they just do one thing. They don't change any variables. <laughs> so this is kind of a, a unique whiskey. It's more of a, more like a lowland Scottish whiskey. Um, it's distilled uh, by the Inland Sea on the Itachi Strait. It gets the highest temperature and the lowest rainfall in Japan. Actually, this is the this is the distillery that got the first Japanese whiskey license in 1919, but waited more than 40 years to actually produce anything. Is this made from corn? This is a blended, also malt and grain. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, that's a really good question. There are some Japanese whiskeys that are rice, but only a very few of them. Most of them are most of them are barley, which is malt, or corn, or blend. A lot of the barley is imported from the UK. Yeah, it's actually too expensive for them to harvest uh, at home. I'm not sure why. So this has about, uh, hey Brad, about 10 parts per million of peat. Uh, they distill sake at this distillery most of the year, September through March, and then uh, whiskey uh, April through July, about two months. Brad, there's a spot right here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, that was so they're going to bring out the next course. Actually, I guess the first course after after the right. guys are just actually right now. Uh, so while you're shooting, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the two gentlemen, the two grandfathers of the scene. So pictures for them a little bit later in life now. Oh, so what's our what's our first course here? So course number two is going to be a tuna tartare served with house-made potato chips. In the tartare, there's a togarashi aioli, some salads, and caviar. Whoa. Please enjoy. This is fun. All right. So where we left, last left, Mr. T and Tori, uh, they, they finally joined forces at the Kotobukaya Liquor Company. Uh, they're not this old yet, uh, but just an anecdote. So right after Mr. T came back, uh, or actually while Mr. T was studying in Scotland, Tori had uh, filled just by accident an old wine cask with some alcohol for blending and forgot about it. He came back in a couple years and was amazed at the result that the whiskey, uh, I mean that the barrel had rendered into the alcohol, you know, different color, different flavor. So what did he do? He was, he was a businessman. He bottled it up and sold it. And it was immediately uh, popular. Uh, he couldn't make any more, but he wanted, he wanted, you know, he kind of found his calling. And so his dream was to create the authentic Japanese whiskey. Um, and so that, now he has a dream, and he's going he's to go after that. So his first step was to set up a, a proper malt whiskey distillery, and with an experienced Scottish distiller. So he talked to some of his acquaintances, and they're having an idea, you know, who should we have set up this distillery of? Uh, back at the Shuzo Company, an acquaintance suggested the same uh, Japanese fellow who had gone to Scotland to study and had just come back. So that's where Masataka Takatsuru had entered the Kozukaya Liquor Company. And together they uh, collaborated. So I have kind of, now their paths have, have really joined here. Together they're collaborating to build the Yamazaki Distillery, Japan's first distillery. They had a lot of creative differences. But they, started, they, they decided on the, uh, the Yamazaki distillery. Initially, the liquor coming out was poor in spirit, 
and actually met Mr. T went back to Scotland to further study at Hazelburn. Uh, during this time, the Yamazaki distillery is closed. Uh, but Shin Shinjiro Tori, again, back to his bottling, back to his mixing days, uh, his blending days, was day there day and night, and really mixing and trying and studying the maturation of the barrels, studying all the variables again. So really, I think, becoming as technical as Mr. T in terms of his understanding of Japanese whiskey. Uh, so that's where kind of this, this period, there's this gap in Takat Service history. Uh, they joined forces to set up this distillery, but it wasn't, it wasn't popular. Uh, but in 1929, uh, after Sinjiro Tori had really studied a lot in how to mix it and make his, his uh, distillery productive, he launched the first whiskey out of Yamazaki under the Centauri brand. And Centauri was a combination of the sun, remember the red disc of Akadama, his first port wine uh, that he had released, and his last name, Tori. So Sun Tori, that's where that comes from. He released two whiskeys. It was a white label and a red label. It had a burnt, smoky taste, which he liked, but it wasn't super popular with the Japanese palate. Again, the guy didn't learn from his experience with the wine mixing. Uh, he released it and really tried everything he could. He was taking his bike to different places, trying to sell this burnt, smoky whiskey that he loved that nobody else did. Um, and uh, in night, so let's see, this was released in 1929. In 1930, uh, again, they had creative differences. They were both leaders in their in their industry, but just I mean, they're acquaintances, but they, and they were trying to do something innovative, but they just didn't quite get along. So, uh, Mr. T was demoted to beer manager. <laughs> <laughs> again, soul crushing work. Uh, he really wanted to learn, though. He stayed there for a little while. Uh, he learned a lot about beer, and, and there's actually a lot of uh, influences on beer now in the whiskey industry. So there was things to learn. Um, but there are a lot of other operational changes, and, and finally, Masataka Takatsura left in 1934. And that's where we get to the Nika whiskey. Uh, we're not going to try it yet. Don't pick up your glasses. Oh. <laughs> so now, he has the same dream as Tori. He wants to set up the first authentic Japanese whiskey. I mean, there's already one, but he wants to do it in his own way. So uh, he finally gets enough money uh, together. He establishes the Dine Nippon Kaju Company and the Yoichi Distillery. Interestingly, his wife, Rita, was giving English classes to, you know, to different people's, uh, different gentlemen's wives, so they could learn English. So she introduced him to two uh, money backers so that he could start his Yoichi Distillery. Uh, he started that through the, as I said here, the Nippon Kaju Company, which translated means the great Japanese juice company. There's two reasons why he might, he might uh, have started an apple juice company. So one, similar to Tori's model, you want to get enough, whiskey takes time to mature. You can't just start distilling it, and bottling it, and selling it. Um, so if he sells Apple products, um, there's a new one. He was coming up with an Apple brandy that was popular. He has an influx of money to then experiment with and invest with. Another story that I read online, uh, not in the books, was that maybe he lied to the, uh, to the people that had no idea that he wanted to do a distillery. He, just, he was just telling them he was going to make apple juice. So we don't really know the story on that. Anyway, he did search uh, for, a long, for a long time for the right distillery. He ended up uh, in north, northern Japan with the Yoichi distillery. He considered it ideal, similar to Scotland in climate and natural features, and he wanted to make a whiskey with a taste of the wind. Uh, Yoichi is a half mile from uh, the sea at the mouth of the Yoichi River and surrounded by mountains on three sides. Uh, again, very similar to the Scottish Highlands and water being extremely important to the Japanese. With the money from the apple brandy, he bought uh, a pot still, uh, the same one used in Osaka at the Yamazaki distillery. An interesting side note about the pot stills. So these are pot stills, the Texas pot. And you see this gentleman here, he's raking the coals. So uh, the pot stills at Yoichi are still what they call direct heated using coals. Every seven to eight minutes, a worker shovels into a furnace uh, coals into each still. And they, jump, they adjust the temperature by just raking it and knowing what they're doing. And it's a custom technique to, to this distillery. You know? So they say you know, it requires a highly skilled craftsman to do this work. And this method was used in Scotland up until the 1970s, but it's not anymore. 
Uh, now there's a lot of steam heating, which has advantages. You can control the temperature a lot better, and it's cheaper, and it's more environmentally friendly. Um, but the old-time distillers uh, would say that it, it uh, loses something intangible to the character of the whiskey. Um, so it's so important to the Nika distillery that they don't lose that intangible character that they actually spent a hundred, uh, I don't know if this is right, like a hundred, uh, not a hundred yen, it must be a hundred million yen, to preserve and upgrade their distillery so that they could still do the direct coal heating. And uh, it's something that they really, they really value the, uh, the character of their whiskey, and, and we'll see that at the, at the next distillery. So the Yoichi distillery is still used today. Uh, <coughs> And now we're going to move also to the Mayagikyo distillery. And, and this is the pot still used at that distillery. So at this point, we can probably try the Nika whiskey. This is one of my personal favorites. So this is a single grain whiskey. It's made with a coffee still, which is a two column still. Uh, two column still. It's a more efficient distill distilling method. So it's not unlike uh, for those few technical engineers in the audience. Clint, yeah. <laughs> it's not unlike a sieve analysis, right? Where you, you, you shake sand through your sieves, like an under nine. You know, it's a lot like that. So it, it takes the whiskey. <laughs> So on the nose, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit bourbon and vanilla. Uh, you might know I really get a lot of licorice and uh, molasses out of this taste. This again, my personal favorite. I would say the notes the finishing might be corn, sweet, some vanilla. Again, the two column skill, the two column still results, results in a higher proof and a lighter, lighter character. The Maigiko Distillery is the culmination of Masitake Takatsuro's dream of authentic Japanese whiskey. And, I mean, look at the picture here, this lake, I mean, the river. So 30 years after setting up his company, he sets his eyes on starting a second distillery to create a more complex blend of whiskey. Again, he's not going to share anything with anybody. He wants to create a more complex character. So he, he, he and his son went out to survey all these sites. This was actually the first site that they, they arrived at. And this kind of foggy glen, sandwiched between two rivers. This is in 1967. So Mr. T sat down by the river and asked for some whiskey. I just, I love this story. He mixed some black Nika whiskey with the river water. And it's actually called Mizuwari, is the way they prepared it. It's, it was fairly popular at the time. Um, and he just loved the taste. So again, the water is just really important. And the river also happened to be called Nikawawa, Nikawa, or Nika River. And uh, imagine it's his own company. This is 30 years later after starting his company. He's so close to finishing his dream of having two different distilleries, and it just happens to be called the Nika River, which is what he named his company. Um, so they call this kind of a, a karmic good luck. The name for that is Goen, as a Japanese concept. So he decided then and there that this would be the site of his second distillery. The distillery was really fit into the terrain. He wanted to keep the national, the natural very uh, undulation of the, of the mountains and the trees, and he really went to great lengths to achieve that great expense to achieve that with the construction of the distillery to really harmonize it with, with the location. And think of that, 1967, who was thinking about harmony with nature and, and business practices? I mean, in 1967, we were just plowing through with industry, right? Who cared about the environment? We care about it now, but who cared about it then? He did, right? And it's just amazing. Uh, so in 1972, a new blend was launched. It was the first Japanese blended whiskey created in the Scottish tradition, the first one in 1967, 30 years after he started his company. Imagine the feeling of that accomplishment. By combining malt from the various distilleries with grain whiskey, uh, he was able to, to complete the true Japanese whiskey. And I just have this quote, Maigikyo distillery is a beautiful example of a factory coexisting with nature. It's tucked away between two rivers, the Hirosagawa and the Nikawa. It's not uncommon to be greeted by a wild monkey sitting on the edge of the bridge over the Hisagara uh, River. 
John, uh, John Coyle here had a, a great question. What, uh, what happened during the war? And I don't, it's actually a really intricate history of Japanese whiskey, so I'm not going to reproduce it perfectly. But uh, in essence, it kind of saved Japanese whiskey because it was a really hard time on, on the uh, economy. But the uh, Japanese government actually hired uh, it's a Suntory company to make a new distillery for them purely for uh, engine fuel, <laughs> the alcohol, I think it was but but butane. They made a distillery to make butane. And uh, the day they cut the ribbon on that distillery, the war ended. <laughs> they, got paid, they got paid to make a new distillery, and then they got to use it immediately. So uh, that's one nuance of it, but uh, it did help the Japanese whiskey economy. Well, while you're eating, I'll just, I'm going to play this, um, and you feel free to drink the, uh, the Hibiki Harmony, which is what we just were watching. Uh, but Hibiki, Hibiki means resonance, and the chief blender, Koichi Anatomy, was inspired by the fourth movement of Brahms' first symphony, and it's to symbolize the importance of time, and I wanted to show you the bottle. So the bottle has 24 facets, this is the part. Thanks, 24 facets on the bottle to symbolize 24 hours in a day and the 24 small seasons of the Japanese calendar. And it's up here on the, on the uh, presentation, kind of where the facets come from. There's 24 seasons, and really it's an emphasis on time. And the nose of the whiskey, you might notice a uh, rose, the sandalwood, the palate, when I taste the candy, the orange peel, and white chocolate. Uh, and they actually use a hint of the Visitora oak, a special Japanese oak. And again, I just want to point out the craftsmanship. I mean, it's pretty infused, you know, an idea with the whiskey, and they put that in, complete that with the bottling, 24 facets on the bottle, and they just take incredible pride in the craftsmanship. And all, all the different Japanese whiskeys, I think you'll notice the same thing. So enjoy the last whiskey, and while you're having your dinner and the, and the last uh, whiskey tasting, uh, I'm going to play Brahms uh, for Symphony. <laughs> 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 Thank you. You've been listening to The Art of Engineering. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and at www.taepodcast.com.